All right. Uh, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, yes. Praise God. God is good, isn't He? Amen. Yes. Any prayer requests tonight? Michael. Just watching over uh, Tammy so she'll get better. Uh, and Suzanne's dad. Uh, they take him to the doctor tonight. They, everything is, is, is according to plan as far as healing and everything else coming forth. All right. Amen. Let's also continue to remember Tim's family. <clears throat> Excuse me, his sister passed away last week. And they were down in Columbia for the funeral, and he's working tonight. So let's just remember them for the Lord will just comfort them and reveal himself in a, in a powerful way for them realize the peace of God that passes all understanding. Amen. Amen. Anything else? Any prayer requests? Any uh, praise reports besides that? Alright. Any announcements? Do I change this? Yeah. yeah, right Right. click. Tom Stammon, Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. September 26th. Again, this is a uh, not, we're just letting him use our building for the venue because the people who were originally uh, scheduled to hold the meeting had some sickness and other issues and so we, uh, we just made our building available to them so they can do this. But everyone's welcome to come and participate, be part of it. That's it. All right. It's time to praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to go through the Oh, well, we Ron, would you mind uh, taking up the offer? I know we got to pay our tithes tonight, even if there's nothing to so press. Amen. Thanks, Ron. Father, well, we just thank you. For your goodness and your mercy, as your word says, we just could just a little experience which you have for them that's good. Thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for each day. Thank you for all the blessings you've blessed us. I ask you to be with us this evening. Open up our minds, our eyes, our ears. They hear and understand. Give us wisdom and understanding. Amen. 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 God bless you as you go. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face.
If I could just see your face.
much. You may be seated. Thank you, Mike. Mike, worship team. Not and, but inclusive. Yes, Mike, praise the Lord. God bless you, Mike. Appreciate your faithfulness. Praise the Lord. redeemed 
can also mean remake. Okay? So, uh, just speaking of human beings in general terms, and Christians uh, as well, we are generally impatient, short-sighted people. Thank you, Mike, for the hallelujah, yeah. praise the Lord, amen. And that's just a fact, and that is, in one sense, that's what Sarah is saying as well. We just, you know, we, we, we can only see this, what's in front of us, and, you know, in the natural. And uh, and so we're impatient to get that, and, yep. and so we think that if I just do more, I can make it happen sooner, and on and on and on. All right, let's go to John chapter 5, and we'll read verses 1 through 9. John 5, verses 1 through 9. Now, I'm going to use two different kind of uh, examples here tonight, but just to show you that redemption and, 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 and what God is doing is in everything, not just in certain things that we think of, but in all of our lives. You think about this. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now, this, is, this has been a thought something that I've meditated on for years and years, and that is that, see, God was working in my life before I was ever born, to be quite honest. But all through my life, we think, you know, when you hear it in Christian circles, it was, you know, on such and such a day, at such and such a time, at such and such a place, I found the Lord, or I got born again, or I can, you know, pray, pray to prayer. And the truth is, that there may have been a specific point in time where you responded to this reality of God and you connect the connection. But the truth is it started before you ever got here. Mm -hmm. And God has been working this redemptive process every day, day in and day out through our entire lives. Mm -hmm. What that one of the things that that tells me is how much God loves me. Because that's an issue that we all kind of deal with accepting, you know, believing in love. Because we live in a world where it's just phony. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that said it's called love, but it just it just isn't. So right. it's a powerful thing that God is trying to show us. So after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and the Jews went up to Jerusalem. If you do any uh, research into this, you'll find that this was the feast of the Passover. And so this there was this feast, the feast of the Jews. It was the feast of Passover. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem, like all the other Jews, to celebrate the Passover. Now he says, there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool. A pool which is called, in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. Bethesda means house, Beth is house, house of mercy is what that word actually translates really? into English. Cool. Having five porches, <clears throat> and in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, meaning he was lying there, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. So this guy... Um, this... I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so... This, this guy watched while other people ignored him. Mm -hmm. You ever, David had this thing, he said, you know, I, I don't get this, I almost fell out, I almost backslid or whatever, however you want to call it, when I saw the evil being rewarded, when I saw bad people getting blessed. Mm -hmm. You just ever seen really, just really bad people that yep. just seem like good stuff happens to them and you wonder yep. why? Is that happening, you know? Right. Well, that's kind of where David was. And that's what this guy is kind of in his in his mind. He, he's Other people are ignoring him. He's in this condition. He's been there 38 years. They even step over him so that they can get their own healing. So they can get what they want. So they can get their blessing regardless of what he needs. Amen? 
Now, day after day, for a long time, we see, this guy lays there paralyzed, just inches from people celebrating their healings. That yeah. can, <laughs> praise the Lord. Yeah. Rub it in. affect you. Uh, amen. Your spirit, praise the Lord. For 38 years, he had to fight these feelings of resentment, jealousy, mm -hmm. despair. But he didn't give up. How could he actually? He was paralyzed. He didn't have much of a choice, did he? No. But the point is, he could have decided, this isn't going to happen for me. Everybody else is getting it, but I can't get there, and so there's no way God's going to heal me or <clears throat> deliver me or whatever. In his spirit, you know, he could have just given up hope. He could have just said, forget it. Drag me back home and leave me there. I'll just lay there instead of going through all this hassle and watching everybody else get blessed, and I'm still struggling and not getting anything. In the end, of course, it wasn't the pool that he needed. It was Jesus. Right. It's the living water. Amen. <laughs> See, for too, off, too long and, and often as Christians, we think that a material substitute is going to cure our problem. Mm -hmm. When it's just Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I could just get this new car, you know, if I could just get another house, if I could just get a, you know, a better job, if I just could get, you know, uh, the next contract, if I could just get a new relationship, if I could just get a new whatever, everything would be better. Everything would just be okay. Amen? So, let's go back to John. If we came back up to verse 1, and we'll just read verses 1 through 6 this time. Now again, I'm talking, this is at the season, at the, the uh, feast of the Passover is what's kind of the surrounding reality of what's going on here at the sheep pool. So after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. Now I'll tell you, I've got several books on Jewish uh, cultures and history, and uh, one of them by Eidersheim is a, is a really good book because it goes into all of their kind of their traditions and how a lot of times what we read in the Bible we think is you know like something new to us but it's been going on for centuries and centuries and the Jewish thought and remember this was written most of this was written especially in the Gospels was written to Jews about Jews and so sometimes we read it all out of context and have trouble trying to figure out what it really means to us so so I'm just saying some of the information I'm giving you is Hebrew tradition. It's rabbinical tradition. It's what's been taught for them ever since the Old Testament, all the way back. So now there is a, Jew, a Jerusalem the sheep market, a pool which is called the Hebrew in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, all withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Four and five. Sorry. Or actually, all the way through six. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. A certain man was there, which had an infirmity for thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The sheep market is also called the sheep gate. Now, relative to the pool that we're dealing with here, the sheep are brought through the sheep gate to this location by the pool. That's where the sheep market is. It's just up above where this pool is. Now, sometimes when they would take the sheep to the market, or in this case, whenever there were feasts, they would bring them to the market where a sacrifice, whenever this, they picked the sheep out that were going to be sacrificed, they would be washed and then they'd be sacrificed. That's where it was done. Mm. Sometimes, the blood from the sacrifice would spill into the water around where they were bathing and sacrificing these sheep. Wow. That water then would run down into the pool called Bethesda. Mm. Not all the time, but occasionally this would happen. The blood, according to the rabbinical tradition, is probably what troubled the water or what caused people to scamper towards the water or try to get into the pool. They'd see the blood in the water sacrifice, so they're trying to get there, right? Wow. 
So when the blood of the sacrifice would come into the pool, it would cause healing to flow from that sacrifice. Uh oh, here we go. So it's a reality. I mean, I it really it. was a real thing. It wasn't an angel coming down there necessarily and doing anything. That was their way of relating to it. But the truth was, sacrifices were taking place, and the blood of those sacrifices sometimes would come down into that pool, and that is what would heal. Hmm. And so whoever got in first got the healing. Amen? Amen. As I said, Bethesda means house of mercy. It says it had five porches. Five is the number of grace. Yay. So all these, everything in the Bible is trying to tell us something about Jesus and his redemptive properties, his mm -hmm. ability. Amen? Amen. So it had these five porches, and uh, it was, there were impotent people, blind people, halt people, withered people, and Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? Now, it's interesting, he didn't say do you want to be made whole. Do you want to be healed? He, have, he sees something more than the fact that this guy's paralyzed. There's a bigger issue than just his physical condition. So Jesus asked him, he said, do you want to be made whole? Well, you got to figure, after 38 years of being bitter, of being tipped off and aggravated and frustrated with God, with all these other people, these other Jews who are just, you know, stepping over him and ignoring him and forgetting all about him, and he's seeing everybody else get healed. You can imagine, 38 years... There could be some real hostility going on inside this guy, a real anger towards God. Have you ever, you know, look, it happens. You lose a loved one. You can get, I mean, look, I, hey, I've been there. I just lost a nephew here a couple of weeks ago, passed away. And I got to tell you, I talked to God about it. I said, you know, I don't get this. I don't like this part of this thing at all. It's not right. It's just, you know, that we have to go through all this crap. That we have to suffer. That we have to live with that kind of pain and sorrow. Well, Jesus was a man of sorrows. And it's up to us to claim these healings and to, to receive redemption. And everybody's not in the same place, and so you can't blame God because this happens and that happens. And I'm not blaming God, it's just that I think, geez, how, how, how screwed up this world is, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's obviously how this guy felt, and probably way more bitter than me because he was going through the same thing over and over and over and getting no results. Amen? Amen. So Jesus is going to do more than heal this guy's physical body. Jesus, the ultimate sheep gate, the door to the sheepfold, right? The true shepherd, the true lamb of God, the true sacrifice, the standing right there looking at this guy wanting to know, do you want to be made whole? Now it just goes, it shows you something of religion. How we can we can take all of these types and shadows and try to make them the reality. Yeah. Amen. When it's all about Jesus, it's all about Jesus. Everything is about bringing us to this revelation of this Redeemer. Amen. Amen. And so. Under the Old Covenant, this guy has to wait for a certain season for the timing to be just right, for the blood to make it all the way to the pool. Everything's got to just be in sync. Amen? So we've got the ultimate Lamb of God there. He's at the house of mercy. He has God's mercy in human flesh, actually. As grace available. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 14. The space of which we came from, and the space in which we came from Cadiz Barnea, it's not talking about linear space to talk about time, which we came from Cadiz Barnea until we were come over the brook Zered was thirty and eight years, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the hosts as the Lord swear unto them. Hmm. Hmm. Now, there's several really pertinent pieces of information there, but the length of time that Israel was in the wilderness until they crossed into the promised land, they wandered 38 years. Yes. 
In Hebrews 4, it talks about the promised land. People, us failing to enter into the promise. So that promised land is more than real estate. It's obvious because the, the fulfillment of that we see in, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. It's the rest of God. It's the result of the finished work of Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. To Sarah's point, to all of these men who thought they were going to fight their way in, died. Right. Because that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was, I have given you this land. Right. You don't have to fight. You just got to show up in faith because mm -hmm. I've already taken care of the enemy if you'll believe me. So we waited until all of these fighting men are dead. So talk about wholeness. See, this is more than a temporary fix. This isn't you're going to win a battle and then everything's going to be okay. No, God has already fought the battle. God has already taken care of it. It's grace. Yes. And so he tells the man at the pool, take up your bed and walk. And that bed is a symbol of rest, is it not? Yep. Mm -hmm. He's taking, he says, take your rest and go. In the power of rest, hallelujah. Walking out the finished work of Christ is what this guy's doing. Mm -hmm. You say, well, he's walking, he's laboring. No, he, he's resting in what Christ has done for him. Yes. yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me, let me read something to you from the Message Bible. This is, uh, this is Lamentations. And it's uh, chapter 3, beginning at verse 46. Our enemies shout abuse. You ever heard the devil just abuse you verbally? Mm -hmm. You jerk. I mean, what an idiot. You think you're actually going to accomplish this? You think you could do this? You think this God's really going to do this for you? And, and just mock you, basically, yeah. you know? And so he says, our enemies shout abuse, their mouths full of derision, spitting invective. We've been to hell and back. We've nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. Rivers of tears pour from my eyes at the smash-up of my dear people. The tears stream from my eyes, an artesian well of tears, and tell you, God, look down from on high. Look and see my tears. When I see what's happened to the young women in the city, the pain breaks my heart. Enemies with no reason to be enemies hunted me down like a bird. They threw me into a pit, then pelted me with stones. Then the rains came and filled the pit. The water rose over my head, and I said, it's all over. Have you been there? Mm. Praise the Lord. Amen. I called out your name, O God. Called from the bottom of the pit. You listened when I called out. Don't shut your ears. Get me out of here. <coughs> Save me. You came close when I called out, and you said, it's going to be all right. You took my sight, Master. You brought me back alive. Praise the Lord. The English Standard Version translates that last verse as, You have taken up my cause, O Lord. You have redeemed my life. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. I can honestly say, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, the whole works. Praise the Lord. Multiple times. And probably all of this happened, you know. But, of course, my situation was far worse than yours. Because <laughs> it was mine. <laughs> but anyhow, amen. The enemy's laughing at you. You took a step of faith, and the devil just thumbs his nose at you. The enemy's just mocking, you know. You're, you're, you're trying to believe God for this thing. Amen. So the enemy's closing in. You, there's nowhere to turn. You're at the end of your rope, scraping the bottom of the barrel. Life stinks. Yet, in the flash of redemptive glory, God rescues you from the pit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Just freaks you out every time. Amen? Amen? So maybe you're wondering right now, wondering where God is, wondering if He plans to show up. Remember, God's a storyteller. And because God's a storyteller, once upon a time, long ago, there was a man named Judah. Now I'm not going to read this to you because I've talked about this before and it hasn't been that long ago, so you, most of you have, will remember it. If not, you can go look it up. In Genesis 38, there's a story about Judah. Judah has a son and marries his son marries a woman by the name of Tamar. His son dies. 
Jewish tradition demands that his younger brother marry his widow so that they can continue on the genealogy of the family. The young brother marries her and he dies. And he does some other stupid stuff in the process that aggravates God. Because he doesn't want her to get pregnant by him because that child will get the inheritance that he wants to go to his own children and not to the seed of his brother because that's, that, that's how that is reckoned. Any mm -hmm. children that they have will be considered his brother's children. Amen. So, uh, he dies. Judah doesn't take care of his daughter, step or daughter-in-law, as he should. He kind of just puts her off to the side and goes on about his business. Well, she's got no one to take care of her now. She has no offspring, so she has no future, really, as a woman living in that age, in that culture. So she goes into town and dresses up like a prostitute. And Judah, her father-in-law, comes through, and of course he doesn't recognize her. She's got the veil and the whole thing, and, and he's looking for love in all the wrong places. And he hooks up with her, and they go and do what they do. And he doesn't have the money to pay her. He's going to give her a lamb. And uh, she says, well, then leave me your ring and your staff as a down payment. And then when you sell your herd or when you bring your herd to town, you can give me the lamb and I'll give you your stuff back. Now, they've had intercourse. He doesn't know it's his daughter-in-law yet. right? She knows who he is. He doesn't know who she is. So he goes away. He comes back a week later with the lamb. Can't find a prostitute. She's not in the corner she was on before. She's not out there anywhere. And he's looking all over for her because she's got his ring, amen, and his, uh, it's like a power of attorney, mm -hmm. and, and his staff. Right. So he's looking all over, can't find her, throws a big fit, goes home, and she comes back and tells him it's me. And she's pregnant. <laughs> Pretty simple. Jeez. Well, ultimately, he does right by her, but this guy's a jerk to begin with, and then it, it all comes back around, right? So here's the deal. Here, my point is, the, the sordid intrigue of this family doesn't end there. About five generations later, another woman had a hand in ruining the family name. I did. I worked at it. Praise the Lord. We all we all done things, you know. You can look back and go, oh man, that was not cool. That wasn't smart. This is just an example, okay? So five generations back, you look at that and go, oh my God, what? A, that was sick. That was just weird, you know. And so five generations pass, and another woman comes along, and her name is Rahab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now Rahab didn't pretend to be a, pro a prostitute. She made a career choice. That's what she was. That's how she right. made a living. That's that's who she was. Amen. But when these righteous men come along, looking for refuge, looking for a place to hide from the, from the people of that city and from that country, amen, she protected them and helped them escape. Rahab, the prostitute, eventually marries a Jew of, of the people of God that are coming into the promised land now. And she has a son, and she names him Boaz. Now we just, I talked about this a couple weeks ago, but Boaz then is given the opportunity to redeem a woman mm -hmm. like those in his family that are going through problems. His family had a history of women at risk, risk of dishonor, risk of disgrace, risk of humiliation and all that. Now Ruth is in the same boat. So he's got this opportunity to redeem her the woman's name is Ruth, and she's the widow. Not only does she need a husband so that she can continue her shrinking family lineage, because it is, everybody, all the boys are dead, and all she's got is her mother-in-law. And so she and her mother-in-law need to have someone bail them so that they can survive, just so they can get by. Amen? And so Naomi's her mother-in-law, and Boaz... The kinsman redeemer, he takes Ruth to be his wife. Right? We went through that story here just a while back. So it sounds like a happy ending to a romantic subplot, but there's a romance of another kind just down the generational line. 
Boaz and Ruth, great grandson, threatens to screw everything up again. Remember, this is one family. Dysfunction works in that family. Amen? So there's this peeping Tom. Praise the Lord. And he's watching another guy's wife take a bath. And because he's a powerful guy, he orders to have that woman brought to him. Amen? David and Bathsheba. But the adultery doesn't just end in a messy family history. It ends in murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. I mean, it doesn't get much more sordid than this, if you think about it. If you imagine it's your family. It's not something you'd really want to share with your future spouse or in-laws. Praise the Lord. We've got a bad track record when it comes to relationships. Amen. So this sort of family saga of sex, murder, disgrace, dishonor, and it spread throughout the Old Testament. And then the New Testament comes. And it retells this soap opera in the form of a genealogy. Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 16. Same story, same sordid, despicable, nasty, sinful, ugly behavior. And here it shows up, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I'm not ashamed to call you brethren, he says. Hmm. Son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharaoh and Sarah, and uh, Zerah of Tamar, Pharaoh and Zerah are the sons of the father who had actually an incestuous relationship with his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and Pharaoh begot Esram, and Esram begot Aram, Aram begot Menadab, Menadab begot Nason, Nason begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse, Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begat Rehoboam, Rehoboam begat Abia, Abia begat Asa, Asa begat Josephat, Josephat begat Joram, Joram begat Josias, Josias begat Jotham, Jotham begat Achaz, Achaz begat Ezekias, Ezekias begat Manassas, Manassas begat Ammon, Ammon begat Joseph. Josias, Josias begat Jaconius and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. After they were brought to Babylon, Jaconius begat Southael, Southael begat Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begat Abiad, Abiad begat Eliakim, Eliakim begat Azor, Azor begat Zadok, Zadok begat Aki, Aki begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Nathan, and Nathan begat Jacob. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Praise the Lord. Tamar, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Jesus' family tree. And out of this line of sin and salaciousness comes Jesus the Christ, the Redeemer. Man, it gives me goosebumps just reading that. The sinless Savior and Redeemer of all of our sordid, scandalous past. We are morally crippled. Unable to redeem ourselves. And the Redeemer of history is Himself the redemption of a family history that was ripe for redemption. I told you God's a great storyteller. Amen. This is grace. This is true redemption. This is what He offers to every one of us. This is what He spent our lives creating. Amen. A picture of how God can use our sins for His own ends. Drowning out our evil by funneling it into His own conquering goodness. Praise the Lord. Romans 8.28 
all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Everything in my life, and I think about it not all the time, I mean it's not like I'm morbidly thinking about it, but you can't help, I mean you have a past. There are times when I'm just, Sally asked me yesterday, what do you think about all day? All kinds of stuff. Most of you, you don't want to know. You don't want to hear. Amen. But I do think, I, there's things that happen in your life. And I can see now, there are some days when I'm just, I'll, I'll be sitting on the deck or something and I'll just start thinking about some of these things and just start coming back to you. Know? And I start feeling bad about me. And I rebuke it. And I think, Lord, this is so cool what you've done. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's God. God is the Redeemer. Amen? And so it's, it, it's great to get to the other side of a difficult time and say, ah, now I see what it was God was trying to do. Amen? I understand what it's all about now. But it's entirely different to be in the middle of the mess and the confusion. Amen. I got to say, when I was in the middle of my mess and my confusion, I really wasn't thinking that much about God. I was thinking about my mess and my confusion and what I'm going to do to either make it worse or escape it. It's entirely different to be in that mess and say like the spirit of this invalid at the pool at the sheep gate. God, and this is what he had to be saying to do this for 38 years. I don't know how, but I trust you are using this situation for my good somehow. Something good has to come out of this. I trust. I trust that you've got a plan. I'm trusting in your plan. Not my situation and not my circumstance. Revelation 21, verse 1 through 5. One. Yeah, Revelation 21. 21. 1 through 5. saw new heaven, new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things were passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. He's doing that right now. Whatever you're going through, Whatever you've been through, trust that the God who loves you will sustain you. Amen. He's in control. Mm -hmm. And He is redeeming your life in and through every circumstance you find yourself in. Amen. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, whatever's happening, trust that the former things are passing away. And Jesus is making all things new. Amen. Amen. We've come to the time where we have to trust God. Yes. And thank God we've come to the true house of mercy. The ultimate sheep gate. Yes. To the five porches of His grace. To that which pictures all of the person and redemptive work of Christ. We've come to the ultimate Passover, to the ultimate Sabbath, to wholeness, to completion, to righteousness in Christ, our genealogy. Mm -hmm. It goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Our true identity, brothers and sisters of Christ, born of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Hallelujah. The genealogy moves on. Yes. Someday in that book of genealogies, our name appears. Glory.
in the line of Christ. And I think that's intention, why he intentionally puts this sordid kind of history of his back of his genealogy in there, so that everybody looks and says, "There's hope for me." Yep. If the Messiah can come out of that, we have. It. We are a revelation of his redemption every single day. And when we become uh, overcomers by the word of our testimony and by the redeeming blood of the Lamb. Amen. Praise the Lord. When our words agree with what He's done, yes. Yes, yes. we see the fullness of that revelation in our own lives. Amen. 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 Do not let the enemy discourage you. Amen. Amen. Recognize <laughs> what the enemy's trying to do is get you to give up. Right. What God is trying to do is get you to look to Him. Mm -hmm. Put the focus back on Him. Not on you and fighting the devil. The devil's defeated. Right. You just, if you stay focused on Jesus, you are more than an overcomer because He's already overcome the enemy. Amen. You get the benefit without having to fight the battle. Amen. And I'm telling you, based on what I was teaching Sunday and have been in the last several months, with this great experience of who we are in Christ comes the challenge of the enemy. Mm -hmm. The devil always comes after our identity. He wants us to see ourselves as that person in the, gene in the natural genealogies without knowing that Christ is in that same genealogy. See us as fit, see ourselves as just, you know, working and working and working and why doesn't it pay off? Why doesn't I get why am I not seeing the, you know, the results of all my labor? Maybe people are passing you by, cutting you off at the knees, trying to take advantage because they want the thing that you want to. But God is for you. Amen? He Amen. has brought us to the place of not just physical healing, not just escaping hell, but total redemption. He has given us a new name. He has placed us in His family. Therefore, we have all the benefits of that family. Amen. Amen. All the inheritance belongs to us. And that's what we have to keep our focus on. He's not far from any one of us. He's as near as the words out of our mouth. If we can confess Him, we have every redemptive benefit that He gave us. Amen. 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 We will succeed. We will win. Amen. Amen. If we just keep the focus on Him. We'll have our fullness. The fullness of who we are will come. We'll take up our bed and walk and rest in the finished work of Christ. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Fight the good fight of faith. Praise the Lord. You are victorious in Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Appreciate you being here tonight. Have a good rest of the week. Take advantage of your inheritance.